Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk. So pop the kettle on, this is the Royal Tea. I'm Sarah Hewson. Coming up on today's show, Prince Harry returns to the UK, but his father, King Charles, is apparently too busy to see him. Plus, find out which title William is to be given, which could be seen as a snub to his younger brother. Joining me today to discuss all that and more are Royal Commentator Daisy McAndrew, Royal Commentator Afia Hagen and The Sun's former Royal Correspondent Emily Andrews. Hello to all of you. Harry is back. The Prince attended St Paul's Cathedral with his mother Diana's relatives while the King and Queen hosted a garden party. The Duke arrived in the UK on Tuesday afternoon for the service of Thanksgiving to celebrate the 10th anniversary of his Invictus Games. Um, a really big moment, actually, 10 years of the Invictus yeah. Games, which has been remarkable in its achievements and what it has done for so many people. But I think what stood out for me, Daisy, was to see Harry there on his own. Yeah, and I have to admit, I was really surprised. And I, I thought in the back of my mind, I thought that Meghan would come. Yes. Because we all know how important this, how important Invictus Games is for Harry. And we know that they are very close. And I just kept thinking, I bet she comes, I bet she comes. So I was completely wrong on my predictions uh, on that. And then I think like most people, when you think about this family as a family rather than royals, I was really saddened and mm. quite shocked that there wasn't a time in the diary that was found uh, for Charles and Harry to meet. And of course, many people saying, oh, you know, Charles is back to doing duties and his diary's too full. It just doesn't wash, really. Yeah. If you're the king, you can say to whoever's organising your diary, mm -hmm. find me 20 minutes, or find me a dinner, or find me a car journey, something. Mm. I agree with you. It does feel like a snub on behalf of the King to Prince Harry. And I think that's a real shame. We know that his diary has been very carefully managed and Buckingham Palace were very clear to say that, you know, the cancer is not cured. He's still undergoing treatment and he does have to be careful. I get that 100%. But this doesn't, it, it does feel like a snub. And I think it's a real shame, you know. And I also think it's a shame, actually, that nobody from the royal family attended the Invictus service. If not, if for it not to be about Prince Harry, but to support the Invictus Games and how absolutely incredible it is and, and the things that they've done, harnessing the power of sport, uh, using it to get veterans back involved in their own lives. Like, it's... It's an incredible thing. But I don't know. I mean, think those Harry who have taken part, there are many yeah. who say that it has saved their lives. Literally. Yes. And you heard people talking about that at the service, you know, giving their testimonials, talking about how incredible this thing has been for them and for their families. Uh, but I don't think Prince Harry was on his own. You know, he did have. Um, people from the Spencer side of the yes, family. Yes, he had Earl Spencer and Lady Jane Fellows, yeah, there, his and aunt I, and uncle. I think it was really, really lovely to see them there. Um, gorgeous to see him having that support. I'm really glad that he did have that. I'm like you, I think I thought that Meghan would just pop up out yeah, the car and I'd be like, yay. But again, she doesn't want, like I always say, she doesn't want to be cannon fodder for the British tabloids. And why not? And she's busy packing for Nigeria, <laughs> as am I. Yes, which we'll talk about in a moment. Emily, you were at St Paul's Cathedral ahead of the service. I was. Uh, yesterday. What kind of reception did Harry get? Well, the first thing to say, actually, was that there were a lot of police there. Mm. Security was very high. And of course, Harry is still um, pursuing his case against the British taxpayer and indeed um, at the High Court because he wants his Metropolitan Police security back. But actually, the City of London police were out in full force yesterday. There was some people are gathered. Um, there were, you know, people are gathered to sort of um, see Harry. Um, there was some, there was a lot of cheering. There's a lot of yes, woohoos. There were, I, it was, has been reported, there were a couple of boos. Um, but yeah, I think Harry got a warm welcome. I mean, f for me, Harry's visit this week has solidified two things. One, Meghan never, ever wants to come back to this country mm, again. Yeah. She was on the guest list for the service 
it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen her at many, many other Invictus events. She's made it perfectly clear that she doesn't really want to come back to the UK. Maybe she will come back via London Heathrow and Harry will whisk her from the Windsor Suite and then they'll go on to Nigeria together. And the other thing I think is clear is that back in February, when Harry jumped on that plane to come here, when his father phoned him to tell him that he was about to undergo cancer treatment, Charles did see him. And Harry thought he was going to see his father in Sandringham. His car actually had to be turned round to take him back mm -hmm. to Clarence House. He was on his way to Norfolk. And I think we all thought then, we all interpreted that then as, you know, olive branch, reconciliation. I actually think nothing has changed with mm. the members of the royal family and they just don't trust him and they do not want to see him. I, I'm with you. I thought we were seeing the foundation mm. stones being laid for some bridge building yeah. because yeah. we'd had the, the news of the phone call uh, for Charles's birthday, mm. that the grandchildren, Archie and Lilibet, had sung happy birthday to him. Harry had then got on the plane and come here in February. It looked as if relations were yeah. thawing, at least between father and son. And, and so, yes, like you, Daisy, I really believed that there would be a meeting now while Harry was back for the Invictus Games. And, of course, it's been known for a long time that he was going to be yeah. back. So there was plenty of time exactly. mm. to put something in the diary, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it, it was. And they found themselves, what, uh, two miles apart. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and yet the distance between them just vast. Yeah. Well, one thing actually that I've heard recently that I hadn't really heard before is that the family, the courtiers as well, but the family is still very angry with Harry for what they see as the as the as the kind of torment in a way that he put the late queen through. That you know, with all we, you know, we talked about this ad infinitum about makes it all that kind of thing, but it, it caused her the late queen Elizabeth real distress. And I think for the members of the family, they can't quite forgive Harry that, and also for the first year of the king's accession. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The one thing I'd slightly disagreed with the fear on is whether members of the royal family, senior royals, should have been at the serve the Invictus service. And I think in some ways that would have overshadowed the server. The service then would have become all about mm. the body language, where they were sitting, the seating plan, you know, whether um, William was there and, and, and shook Harry's hand, all that kind of malarkey. And I think that would have actually done the Invicta service no, no, no good at all. But a private meeting, you know, mm. for us to have been told that there had been some sort of private meeting between Charles and Harry would have been very different. Of course, we should all remember that the last private meeting, Camilla was there, and of course we would all have loved to have been flies on the wall and known how that had gone. But I have heard other people saying, you know, maybe that meeting didn't go well. We, we weren't mm -hmm. given any details. Maybe Camilla thought that Charles was upset after that meeting and that it actually you know, hadn't improved relations, had made relations worse. Obviously, this is pure speculation, but as you said, because we all thought there was a thawing, yeah it still looks pretty frozen. It mm. does. And I think, you know, we all kind of had this, or, or it felt like we could be on the path to reconciliation. Mm. You know, video calls and, and a visit, you know, it, it's pretty much as soon as he had his father had cancer, he was on that plane. And I and, think Harry's rhetoric has certainly changed, hasn't it? It's much more conciliatory. There's less of this calls yeah. and demand yeah. for apologies. Yeah. That's all gone. And yeah. he talks regularly about wanting to see his family and yeah. even this week hope and, to see him soon and he has <laughs> said that in the past you know when he was on the press run for spare you know the the line that really stuck with me that came from that was that he said he wants his brother back he wants his father back as a as a family you know and i think he's always said that and you know when he did that interview when he was um on the ski slopes and he was asked about a few things and mm. you know he did say at that time you know what was discussed between my father and myself is between us and and it looked hopeful it definitely looked hopeful and then we've gotten to this week and it kind of feels like two steps forward and a hundred steps back. I, I do slightly worry that the public will disapprove of Charles mm. not finding the time to see his own son. I've heard, been listening to a lot of radio phone-ins and, and discussions and with people I know myself. And, you know, most people, particularly people who are parents themselves, are saying... If this was my son, mm. pretty much no matter what he'd done, I would find the time to see him, particularly if I had cancer. And I just, I think we've been able to see in the last year since the coronation a much warmer, more human side of Charles, which mm. a lot of people have enjoyed seeing and getting to know and realising that he is a very sentimental, loving person. And I just worry that this might turn people off. I, I, I agree with you, Daisy, but how do we know? How do we know? that Harry is not seeing his father. 
because Buckingham True, Palace... True, it's a very good point. Buckingham Palace has absolutely refused to say nothing pretty much in the That's last two years. True. Kensington Palace, equally, every time we've tried to speak to Kensington Palace about the Harry problem, nothing. Nada. No off the record, not on the record briefing. The reason we know is because Harry's new spokesperson in the UK told us that, unfortunately... Um, his father did not have the time to see his son. And, you know, that's the reason why the royals won't see Harry, because he cashed in on his royal status, which is the numero uno, unforgivable thing to do as a member of the firm. And then, OK, fine, he can be, you know, apologetic in public now and say he wants to reconcile. But every time he is the one giving us that information, they cannot trust him. Trust is a massive issue, isn't it? Mm. Um, and that a pretty fundamental reason why whatever had happened with his father, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have been seeing his brother William and his sister-in-law Catherine. No, I think that boat has sailed certainly for the time being. And there's, you know, there, there are no uh, off the record briefings. There's no you know, white smoke coming up from mm. any palace in the, in, in the country um, that gives any sort of hope that that relationship uh, might reconcile, which again, must be a source of great sadness to Charles mm. and you've got these cousins who never see each other you've got yeah. a grandfather who never sees his grandchildren it is on a human level it is a very sad story and yes. um, mm. so let's talk about what's next for Harry and Meghan because mm -hmm. uh, he's leaving the UK uh, today to join his wife Meghan on a visit to Nigeria uh, the couple are understood to have been invited by the chief of the defense staff the highest ranking military official in the country who Harry met at the Invictus Games in Dusseldorf last September I fear you're off to Nigeria oh, yeah. uh, coming up um, are you covering it we'll see oh um, <laughs> what, is, what, what does this visit mean I mean, it's huge for Nigeria, first of all, that the invitation was accepted. We had um, a Nigerian team at the Invictus Games for the first time last year. They did incredibly well. Um, and uh, Nigeria has the hugest uh, or the most amount of members of the military on the whole continent of Africa. So 230,000 people serving in the Nigerian military across Navy and Army. Uh, and uh, unusually for any country in the world, 30% of those serving in peacetime operations are women. Uh, the UN recommendation for having women serving in the military is 17% and Nigeria has 30%, which is a really, really, mm. I mean, that's Leading incredible. the way. Exactly. Um, and so I think it will be brilliant for highlighting the work that the Nigerian military is doing, whether that's in peacetime operations, whether that's in local operations. You know, we do have, uh, they do have some, some issues with some factions, as every country does, you know. Um, so I think it's going to be brilliant for them. It's going to be brilliant for the country for showcasing Nigeria in a different light. We know there's going to be lots of quote-unquote cultural activities, although not safari, because they don't have safari in Nigeria, uh, Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> and so I think it's going to be brilliant for the country. I think it is going to be brilliant for the military, absolutely in the country, to get this boost from from Harry and Meghan coming and visiting and Afia, there. Do, do we know how many days they're doing on the trip? We don't. So we know that they are flying today, so they'll probably be around, like, I think it's about three or four days that they're looking at yeah. in country. Um, and people are going to say, well, you you know, it's secure enough for them to come to Nigeria, but not secure enough for them to come to the UK. Remember, this is a visit that's been organized by the Nigerian military. Yeah. So probably all of those 230,000 yeah. soldiers will be out in exactly. And I'm, I'm going to predict that we are not going to see them on a colonial Land Rover I think white they will be very yeah. standing no, 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 no. the optics the image of yeah. this visit. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons for the visit as well is Nigeria potentially looking to be a host of the mm. Invictus Games in the future. Birmingham also uh, in the running uh, for it. But if the UK, Birmingham, was to host the Invictus Games here, how difficult a position does that put the royal family in, Emily? Not to be seen to be supporting it at home. Well, I'm a proud Brummy. So in the, in the face-off between Birmingham and Washington, which I think have come down to the final two, I hope Birmingham gets it. And also Johnny Mercer. I mean, it's basically, you know, UK, Harry, US, yeah. Meghan. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that, and obviously Johnny Mercer, um, one of our armed forces ministers, has been very kind of pro this bid for, for Birmingham to get the next Invictus Games 2027. 
it'd be great, obviously, for Birmingham, the UK to give it because also the um, Birmingham hospital is where all the troops from Afghanistan yes, were flown yes. to and had one of my friends, she lost her leg um, being blown up in a, in a tank in Afghanistan. Everybody was taken there. So Birmingham has a real kind of affini uh, affiliation um, and affinity with um, injured veterans. But um, if it were obviously to be in Birmingham, I think, um, of course, we would want to see the royal family there. Mm. Will we see the royal family there? No. No, we won't. Not, I mean, what, what, it's three years away if Birmingham does get it. But I don't think the royal family now <clears throat> think of these issues as problematic. I don't think they think, oh, it's going to be an image problem if Invictus and Harry... I think they think, we're just not going to engage with the Harry problem. He does his thing, we do our thing, that's it. I think when it comes to the Invictus Games in Birmingham, the question I would ask is, can Birmingham afford it? Because they're broke. Yeah. I know. Birmingham I mean, is broke. Yeah, and look at how much the Commonwealth <sighs> Games, when it was held there a couple of yeah. years ago, how much that cost the city. Now, we don't know how, you know, Invictus will be funded, yeah. but, I mean, it would be amazing. It would be brilliant if it could be in Birmingham, but can the city afford it? No, I think that's quite right. Now, the Duke and Duchess's son, Prince Archie, turned five on Monday. The family had a private celebration in the United States before Harry made his way to the UK. And, and Daisy, Archie's birthday wasn't acknowledged by the royals publicly, no. at least. No, and of course, Archie's birthday has been a handy excuse more than once because exactly a year beforehand, coronation, of course, yes. it was Archie's birthday um, that was uh, given as a main reason why Meghan couldn't make the visit. And there will be photographers up and down the land who would like to you know, give thousands of pounds uh, or dollars to get their hands on a picture of Archie. Of course, there are um, uh, privacy matters surrounding them. But yeah, it is, it's been very interesting that these, you know, Archie and Lilibet, we pretty much know nothing about them. I'm imagining they have broad American accents and know very little about the UK. So little snippets in Netflix, didn't we? But yeah. I mean, little snippets is all that the royal family have had yeah. uh, as well. I mean, Lilibet met her grandfather, uh, Charles, when she was over for the, fir for the Platinum Jubilee mm -hmm. at celebrations, that coinciding with her first birthday. But aside from that... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crickets, isn't it? I mean, like you said, the cousins haven't met each other either. Um, and at the, mid at the centre of this, at the heart of this, is a family that is really, really divided. Uh, when it comes to Archie and Lilibet, I think there's lots of people who would love a little bit more of them. But for those privacy reasons, which I think a lot of people can understand yep. as well, um, they'll have to just hang on until they get a bit older. Now, Prince William will be made Colonel-in-Chief of the Army Air Corps. That is despite Prince Harry having served with the unit in Afghanistan. Buckingham Palace announced that the Prince of Wales would officially succeed King Charles as head of the regiment on Tuesday in what could be seen as a blow for Harry during his brief return to the UK. According to reports, the honour would likely have been given to Harry had he not chosen to step down as a working member of the royal family in 2020. Uh, Emily, this appointment was announced back in August, but it's the official handover uh, next week. Um, the timing of the release from Buckingham Palace, the announcement, came, what, just two hours after the Duke of Sussex's spokesperson had, had uh, confirmed there'd be no meeting between Harry and the King. And that's led to some raised eyebrows, should we say? Personally, I think it's entirely coincidental. This um, ceremony, which we're going to see next week, would have been undertaken probably six months ago, or at least a couple of months ago, had Charles not had to withdraw from public life due to his cancer right. treatment. And also you've got to remember that William also has taken a step back because he's been looking after Catherine and the children since January when Catherine had to undergo that abdominal surgery and then of course cancer cells were found and then she started undergoing chemo in February. So all three of them have had a very, very much mm -hmm. reduced workload. So I think we would have seen this ceremony a lot earlier. Um, is this a snub to Harry? No, no, I don't think it is because Harry's not a working royal anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think we... It's it's uh, as we've said. It's it's huge sadness. But it could it would have gone to him, wouldn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Because they, they do absolutely. try and find a connection. We talked about absolutely. Camilla and the the Royal Lancers. Uh, and on he one was of brilliant. And episodes. he was brilliant flying Apache helicopters. And he was brilliant as a you know as a gunner in those Apaches, which are you know the kind of the the lions of the of the sort of helicopter world. And um, I think that 
one of the many sadnesses of Harry and Meghan stepping back is how good that both of them would have been yeah. in their different patronages. And Harry is, you know, the army is still and was so important to him and he would have loved to have a role like that and he would have been brilliant. That was the, the kind of biggest sting in the tail, really, wasn't it, about the Sandringham Summit and the Megxit mm. agreement affair that he lost those military titles and yeah. those connections that were so important to him. Yeah, and that's a real shame because, um, like you so rightly said, he would have been brilliant. And, you know, the army was, he described that as the best years of his life. You know, yeah. that's where he really found himself. Mm. And, and, you know, and therefore we have the Invictus Games because of his time in the army. I've, I've always said that had um, the Sandringham summit been a bit more um, beneficial, had the royal family been able to modernise sufficiently to account for people that perhaps want to still serve the royal family, but want to do it living in a different country or do it part time, then we wouldn't have had, you know, um, the Harry and Meghan documentary or Spare or all this kind of... Fear. I'm let, just going to say finish. two names, four names. Mike Tyndall, Zara Tyndall, Princess Eugenie, Princess Beatrice. That no, and I agree, I agree with you. That's fair enough. They they haven't done all this, but remember that Prince Harry is in a unique position, being the quote unquote <laughs> spare, as he calls himself. And we are going to have a generation you know, coming through with Prince uh, Charlotte, Louis, and George, where you're going to have two spares. I really hate using that phrase, yeah. and so they might you know, come upon a time where they think to themselves, I would like to live in New Zealand and raise cows, but also help out the royal family. Or I would like to live in South Africa and have an elephant sanctuary, but also work with the royal family. Modernization is key here. And that, if that had been enabled, allowed Harry to keep his military titles, allowed him to work for the royal family, but perhaps live in a different Commonwealth country, we wouldn't be where but we he, are now. But, if he, but I, I do disagree with you because, you know, Beatrice and Eugenie have got normal inverted commas jobs and they do have charitable patronages and they do occasionally go to garden parties at the, at the King or Lake Queen's But they're Queen's so far Eucharist. down the line no, of succession. No, 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 they're no, not considered they're, like spares and I hate using that phrase, no, but, but it's they, different they are, they are They are, to use Prince Andrew's awful words, blood princesses and they are representatives of our royal family most most brits could name princess eugenie or beatrice if you showed them a picture just about but it's so you're right harry, harry is the son of the, the king exactly. harry's the son of the king so it is different but it's money and it's always down to money that's the problem with the royals and what harry and Meghan wanted to be working royals to also earn their own money but in the way they wanted to earn their own money that was the problem if harry and Meghan had said you know what we'll stay as working royals but we're going to go and live in america or we're going to go and live because there was the plan for them to go and live in south africa and hadn't the queen actually said to Meghan that she could continue with she could continue acting, really acting which Meghan took as an insult. But actually, I think that was the Queen wanting to modernise and wanting to try and give as much as she possibly could. I have always said there's blame on both sides, you know, ha on both sides. Mistakes made yeah. on both Mistakes sides. Mistakes yeah. made on both sides. It's very, very sad that a way forward couldn't have been found. But there were, there were ways that they could have done it. It's just that Harry and Meghan weren't prepared there wasn't enough compromise, perhaps, mm. on both sides. But, and but also, if you, if you think back to that time, they were in such a rush. That was one of the problems. It wasn't that they were sitting down and saying, you know, can we talk calmly about this? They were literally saying, we are off. And as they said, Gun to the in, head. in the Gun interview to the head. and the book um, and the documentary, you know, they admitted that they felt, you know, that Harry and Meghan felt that this was an emergency and that there was well, this Harry mental health emergency fee. and that they yes. were fleeing. And if you are in an emergency and you're fleeing, you're not going to be able to sit down and thrash out a, a proper, you know, document going forward. You need to do that with time on your hands and not holding a gun to the Queen's head and saying, you know, we are And off. Harry's saying he feared that history was repeating itself and this was yeah. what had happened to his mother all over again happening to his wife uh, and hence that rapid decision to to go um let's talk about queen camilla now opening the 50th coronation library in a school in london this week and she took the opportunity to encourage children to read moreland primary school in islington was paid a visit for on the queen for the opening of their new facility as part of the coronation libraries project camilla told the students it is so important to keep reading if you want to get on in life, uh, she said. Um, I fear this is a really 
big, important cause, literacy mm -hmm. uh, for Queen Camilla. Mm -hmm. And it's something that she's absolutely passionate about. She has her podcast, The Queen's Reading Room, which is all about, you know, the books that she likes and she interviews the authors and things like that. And I think this is a great cause that she's clearly really got her teeth into. And the Coronation Library Project, make, making over all these libraries at schools up and down the country. And as someone who loves reading and is a bit of a geek, I think I would have loved this. I would have loved... Would you have been those two kids oh, who were standing gorgeous. in the corridor? Oh, so excited. They? Oh, she's no. coming. <laughs> they were so cute. I definitely would have been those kids. Absolutely. Um, and libraries are such an important part of every school. Mm. You know, it's a yeah. sanctuary for those kids who just like to get away from it a bit. You know, I've done yeah. some, some work in my daughter's library at her school and libraries are so, so important in school. But do you know that right. one in seven primary schools doesn't have a library? That's incredible. At all. I thought, I thought it was compulsory. No, right? it's not. And one in 11 primary school children has never owned a book. That's not a single book. Incredible. So you know that there is a crisis here, yeah. and and I hate to get all heavy about it, but when you look at prisons, mm -hmm. you know, the number of prisoners that never had access um, to reading, and the number of prisoners um, who can't read is huge. So, so there is there is a real cause and effect. If you don't crack literacy in children, their their futures mm. are completely and blighted. A patron of the National Literacy <clears throat> uh, Trust, and that's I think. Uh, overseeing a thousand libraries in yeah. primary schools and these 50 coronation libraries, but a really important cause. I want to talk about uh, somebody else working hard, in fact, the hardest working royal, uh, Princess Anne. She is reported to have carried out 172 engagements between January and April mm. this year. After senior royals were forced to take a step back due to their health, the princess's already heavy workload increased even more. She was on duty for 68 days, double the amount of other working royals. Probably not going to surprise any of us that Princess Anne has <laughs> stepped up, mm. got on with it. No nonsense, no fuss. Oh, she's amazing. I mean, and I think every other day someone says, I wish you were queen. Yeah. I mean, um, I think that out of the 18 investitures this year so far, 15 have been done by Princess wow. Anne, three by Prince William. And that is no mean feat when you're on, literally on your feet for two hours putting medals on people or even, you know, knighting or whatever. And because at the moment, I think only the King, William and Anne mm -hmm. are carrying out investitures. It'd be nice to see Edward or even maybe Sophie do it, but yeah. whatever, that's up to King Charles to decide. So, and she has been, in an average day, she can travel the width and breadth of Great Britain. She'll get to start in Gloucestershire where she lives and she might travel up to Northumberland. Then she might get in a helicopter and go across to Cardiff. Then she might come to London and then she might go home again to Gatcom. Uh, she is indefatigable and she's absolutely phenomenal. And when you consider that she's, I think she's 72, absolutely amazing. And it is, you know, we we are seeing with Prince William very much his blueprint of how he will be sovereign and how he's going to be sovereign is going to be a very, very different way to how his grandmother and indeed his father is sovereign. And Princess Anne, for me, epitomises the old way of being a monarch and royalty. It's meeting lots and lots of people, shaking lots and lots of hands, sprinkling that royal stardust to the Cattle Farming Institute of Northumberland mm. or the dairy makers, the dairy cheese makers in North Devon. These people go away and think, wow, the royal family are amazing, Princess Anne's amazing. And it's that, that kind of collective admiration and warmth from individual people that creates she, that popularity also, for the monarchy. She also described herself as being the eyes and ears for the monarch yeah. as well, mm -hmm. didn't she? Because when she's out there having conversations. Um, I'm going to move us quickly on because, Daisy, I want to save time for our favourite story of the week. And this is the nine-year-old double amputee boy who has received a royal invitation from Buckingham Palace after he missed the King's first garden party of the season yesterday due to a traffic jam. A downhearted Tony Hudgel from Kent was about to go to bed after spending several hours with his family stuck in traffic on the M20 <coughs> when an official royal intervention boosted his mood. The post on the royal family's page on X said, sorry to hear this, Tony. That's after his mother had uh, said that they couldn't make it because they were stuck. We were looking forward to seeing you too. Fancy trying again another day? Leave it with us. The boy's adoptive mum, Paula Hudgel, said the response had put a big beam back on his face. He'll go to bed tonight knowing that he was missed. Now, Tony Hudgel describes sometimes as Kate 
the Princess of Wales's best friend. Oh, uh, they've yeah. spent a lot of time with him. Yeah, raised Wonderful a huge amount of boy. money, amazing campaigner. And this was very, you know, we all are critical uh, often about social media and the bad that it can do. But this all happened, you know, on Twitter, or X as it's now called, where, you know, a tweet um, was seen that Tony had, his family had put out. Uh, a journalist, a fellow journalist, saw this, retweeted it, said maybe the royal family can help. They saw that. And suddenly, you know, there's a lovely happy ending. So, th this is this is very heartwarming. And of course, you know, there were four thousand people at that garden party, and that will have meant a huge amount to all four thousand yeah, yeah. of those people. When you talk about Princess Anne getting out there and shaking individuals' hands, you know, this will be a, a memory for all of those people, and it would have been for Tony. But now it sounds like he's going to have something even better now. Fantastic. And and as I as you said, Daisy, I mean, great bit of. Uh, PR and a great response from the palace uh, there to make sure that he isn't forgotten and doesn't miss out. But it was a fear, of course, the King's uh, first garden party of the season mm -hmm. as well, and a big moment to, to show that he's back. And he looked overjoyed to be out there on the Buckingham Palace lawn. Yeah, this is where he really wants to be, in amongst it, in amongst the people. I mean, for a change, we had great weather for it, right? The weather's been yes, rubbish very true. up until yeah. this week. So it was a great day for him to be out and about. Uh, only two miles from Prince Harry, like we said. But he looked like he really was really enjoying himself and everybody else did as well. And there was, so was a great um, moment for did him. Did you see that lovely moment that was captured when um, Camilla was trying to rush him? You know, he was, he was dawdling and talking Talking, spending too long and there was this very sort of ordinary married couple moment where she was like and she sort of rolled her eyes at the people I like, can't oh, get him to move on and you thought actually you know, they are just an ordinary well you know, an ordinary couple in the way they interact with each other with these huge responsibilities on their shoulders and the start of you know the busy summer season marked by the garden parties getting underway I think we're going to see a lot of King Charles and Queen Camilla over the next couple of months. Uh, great to see the King back on form. I really hope there's another garden party on the 21st of May. I hope we see him again then. I'm sure with Tony he will... getting an with invite. With Tony, yes. 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 <laughs> I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will like to go if he's feeling able. Um, obviously, Royal Ascot. Um, he's already said that he wants to do at least a day. He was there every day last year in memory of his mother. Uh, also, of course, trooping the colour. Um, may he be on horseback? I mean, he's, yeah. wow. I mean. I salute you, sir. Uh, maybe in a carriage, and um, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of royal engagements over the summer, and it, he can be outside as well. Yeah. yeah. So at least he can do more because the king really does get that energy from the crowd, mm -hmm. and he he really misses. I think you saw the, the, of... the Charles chuckle was yeah. back yeah. yesterday, yeah. wasn't it? Which was really really lovely to see. And that is all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Daisy, Afir, and Emily. If you want to join in with the debate, please leave a comment and make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss a single episode. We'll be back next week with all of the latest on the royal family. We hope you can join us. We'll see you then.